Oke, okay, aku cek mikrofon ya. Oke. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? Our seminar is about to begin. Thank you very much for preparing yourself to join our seminar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. I hope all of us are in a good condition. I'm very pleased welcoming you to the second agenda of our visiting professor program. This annual program is conducted by Agribusiness Study Program, Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Science, Diponegoro University. Our previous meeting has discussed about the risk management in agriculture, and today we will discuss about agri-food supply chain. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Suryani Nurfadilah, but I think it's easier to call me Dila. Uh, I'm from the same department with Busiwi and Pak Kadung from yesterday meeting. Today, I will accompany our honorable speaker and lead the discussion. And now we already have Professor Peter Bat with us. Morning, Peter. Morning, Peter. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Did you have your breakfast? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So we can proceed until evening, right? <laughs> we can. <laughs> no, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, we only have around two hours for today's meeting, and we are looking forward to get new insight from you like usual. Okay. Uh, before we proceed to the main agenda, maybe let's take a picture together to commemorate this day. For all participants, please turn on your camera and our teams will take a screenshot. Okay, everyone, please turn on your camera. Okay, one, two, three. The, the next page. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, the last one. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone, before we move to the main session, let me give a brief introduction about our speaker. For almost 30 years, Peter J. Bat was a professor of food and agribusiness marketing at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia. Today, he is a principal of Peter J. Bat and Associates, an international agribusiness marketing and rural development consulting practice that links smallholder farmers in Asia and Africa to high value market through various international aid agencies, including ACR, CTA, FAO, and the World Bank. Peter has worked in Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Oh, no wonder you seem to know a lot of things about Indonesia. You have a couple of batik, and yesterday you even mentioned about Kementerian Pertanian, right? Okay, uh, let me continue. He is uh, he joined the Western Australian Institute of Technology, now the Curtin University of Technology, as founder, uh, sorry, as a foundation lecturer in the Bachelor of Agribusiness Horticulture degree program. Uh, Prof. Peter Bat has been internationally recognized for his active participation in enhancing the performance of agribusiness supply chains in the transitional economics. So today's topic is very much in his expertise. Now, uh, without any further ado, let me welcome our speaker to deliver his presentation. Are you ready, Peter? I am indeed. Thank you, okay. ma'am. Okay, time is yours. Just for a moment while I bring up the uh, the presentation itself. Sorry, my mouse has been difficult. There we go.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Salama Pagi. It's my it's my pleasure to be with you this morning and to and to be able to to present this, or at least my insights in, in terms of agri-food supply chains. I thought I might begin with some sort of overview or review of, of just sort of agribusiness to help sort of position us and in and, and terms of where we're, we're coming from today. There are multiple definitions, of course, around agribusiness and what agribusiness actually stands for. But it's basically described, of course, as an industry that is engaged in the production operations of a farm. But of course, as we acknowledge here, agribusiness is far more than just the farming operations. It also involves, as you'll see here, the manufacture and distribution of farm equipment and supplies. So in other words, there is a substantial amount of activity in the pre-farm gate in terms of things like chemicals, fertilizers, agricultural machinery, plant breeding, animal breeding. There's, there's a massive industry to actually support agricultural production itself. And then of course, at the other end of agribusiness, is the processing, storage and distribution of the farm commodities themselves. So we now focus not upon so much the inputs, but upon the outputs. So hence the logistics, the movement and distribution of product from the farm to, again, to the cities, to the urbanization, the areas where in fact the food is consumed. But in most cases, as we'll also see a little bit later, the majority of the of agricultural products, with the exception perhaps of fresh fruit, vegetables, some meat, some fish, it's processed. And so there's some sort of transformation that takes place between the product being left, leaving from the farm and by the time, of course, it arrives on the consumer's plate. So when we start to think then about agriculture or agribusiness, it's often described then as a constellation of activities and the supporting institutions that are involved in the world's complex food and fiber systems. So what we actually start to see then, and this uh, diagram or figure is taken from the FAO, starts to look, as you can see, at production, processing and manufacturing, distribution, marketing, consumption, and in fact, then considers the food waste. So what we actually start to think then about our food system in this concept is what is often described as from cradle to grave. So in other words, we actually need to think of how our food system impacts upon our environment, how it impacts then, of course, upon the planet and how it impacts, of course, in terms of both economic sustainability, in terms of things like food security and social inclusion. So our food system is a very complex, as you can see here, constellation that in fact is involved then of not one, but indeed of multiple supply chains. And, what's, and that's what we need to appreciate and understand. And I'll come back to that a number of times throughout the presentation today. So if we acknowledge or accept then that we're embedded within a complex food system, then each and every firm that operates within that system then is embedded within a vertically integrated food and fiber commodity system. And the term that we most often use here is either from farm to fork, or from paddock, or indeed in Southeast Asia, from paddy to plate. That's the nature of what we're looking at in terms of a, of a value chain. But what we also need to appreciate and understand is what's actually happening within our environment. And I know I spoke earlier about a whole range of issues, particularly around things like urbanization and the impact that that's having in terms of our food systems, in terms of the consumer's demand for things like convenience, the increasing demand from consumers for environmental responsibility, the increasing demand for more social inclusion. But what we're also seeing within the agribusiness sector is increasing competition, particularly as a result of world trade organization, trade liberalization, and new competitors constantly inter, inter, entering and interacting within this marketplace. And so this is often described to as a very disruptive influence because it brings about significant changes within the way in which the food chain systems operate. And certainly as we all acknowledge at the moment, we're dealing with COVID, which probably is the most significant disruptive influence we've seen probably in the last, well, certainly post-World War II. 
So with new competitors coming into the market, the dynamics of the market are constantly changing. We also need to appreciate that within the food industry, many regard it to be a very mature industry. And so as a mature industry, we've got new products constantly coming into the market. And with these new products entering the market, we've got a, a great deal of innovation within the food sector. And part of the innovation, particularly, again, as I've indicated, is that most agricultural products are transformed. So we see, again, the increased in demand for health and nutrition, where people are wanting food that is free of agricultural chemicals. It's not only good for the environment, but it's good for them. And nutrition itself is becoming more and more important in terms of the addition then of products to the actual product itself in terms of things like, for example, probiotics and or the addition of various vitamins. So you no longer buy simply apple juice, but now you buy apple juice that's been enhanced or improved with things like vit uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, possibly even vitamin E, and it may even have additional fiber and other things added to it. So what we're seeing constantly then is this innovation to, in to make food more convenient, to actually improve its taste, to improve its shelf life so that we reduce the waste and, and of the food and new technologies that are constantly being introduced that actually, as we've said a moment ago, improve things like shelf life, reduce waste, but also, of course, improve productivity and a whole range of issues then around things like gene transfer technology, GMOs. But of course, all of that technology is contingent then upon the consumer's willingness to accept that product. And particularly then again with the GM technology, there's a whole lot of issues around increasing regulation. And particularly in the food industry, we need to acknowledge the concerns here around food safety. The thing that we have to accept from day one in terms of talking about agribusiness value chains is that the key thing that drives the chain is food safety, an inherent assumption that our final consumers make that the product is safe to eat. And so you'll see most governments then around the world having introduced some food safety regulation to ensure that the product is safe. And increasingly, as we've seen a moment ago, the demands now that the food actually meets some sustainability goals. And that's going to have a whole lot of implications then in terms of market entry. And so what we're starting to see, and indeed, as I was talking earlier with Sui around the, the results of the election, um, in the US this weekend, one of the things that Biden is already talking about is, is re-putting the US back into the Paris uh, Climate Accord. And so as a result of that, you're now likely to see institutional users of food pushing increasing demands now upon the food industry to be environmentally sustainable. But it goes beyond that. It's also about gender inclusion and inclusiveness. So we need to acknowledge and accept that these are the trends that are actually happening within our industry. And as a value chain, looking at how we can best respond to these changes. So what I think we can say right up front is that agribusiness is shifting from being production driven, that is from a supply chain, to being customer driven a value chain. And so this is the distinction then fundamentally between value chains and supply chains. A supply chain is production driven. And much of the agriculture that we see in the transitional economies is production driven, where farmers simply plant and hope that they can sell. The value chain approach is different from the point of view that we look at the opportunities in the market first to determine what will grow and how much will grow and when will grow it. But we're also looking to try to understand what it is that the customer wants, because we have to acknowledge and accept that we are not alone in our capacity and ability to meet the needs of our downstream customers. And so a value chain approach is about being customer driven, about getting closer to and understanding better our customers' needs. And that's going to cause us or result in us wanting to look at obviously being more cost effective in what we do, seeking to reduce and to remove inefficiencies from 
our, our production and, and distribution of food. But what we're also going to talk about very briefly, somewhat regrettably, because I'd, I'd love to spend more time talking about this, but time is short, in terms of understanding the way in which parties collaborate and the relationships the personal relationships that are actually embedded within our food systems. And it's these personal relationships between the different actors in the chain that are actually essential to improving the efficiency of the chain itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation about what some of the dimensions are here that are actually responsible for improving and enhancing these relationships. But what we've fundamentally started to recognise is that to compete, we actually need to collaborate by the actors within the chain working together, collaborating. It's actually far easier to get improvements and benefits to the chain than it is to actually compete. Because the more we actually work together, the we reduce the waste, we come closer to understanding what the needs then of all the focal actors are within the chain, and the chain, of course, works a great deal more efficiently. So when we start to talk then about a value chain, we need to understand effectively what it is. And so what we start to see here is that the value chain describes the full range of activities that are required to bring a product or service from conception through the different stages of production and processing to deliver superior value to the customer at least cost to the supply chain as a whole. So it's the full range of activities, the processes that are actually involved by the multiple actors that are participating in the value chain. And as we've started to see already, we're talking about the input market. We're talking about the actual farm production itself. We're subsequently talking about the output market. And then the processing, <clears throat> the actual transformation of the product, and then the subsequent distribution of that product then within the urban cities to consumers with the objective of delivering superior value to the customer at least cost. So these are the fundamental principles that drive the performance of our value chains. So let's then look now at what one might describe then as a generalized chain, where we need to understand, as I've already outlined, that we've got the input industry, the inputs and the services that are necessary to actually make agribusiness work. And as we've started to talk about it already, these include the seed suppliers, the fertilizers, the chemicals, in the obviously in the animal industry, it's going to be about animal husbandry, it's going to be about animal feed. In the aquaculture industry, it's going to be very similar. You know, somebody's got to produce those, those chickens that are going to wind up then going into the chicken fattening and or into the egg production units. We then look specifically at the production system itself, the activities that occur on the farm or within a, a production environment, be that a, a, a cattle fattening lot or, or an intensive pig or poultry production shed. We then need to consider the post-harvest activities, which are generally around trying to reduce the product loss in distribution then from the farm to the point where that product then is processed and or packaged for subsequent distribution to the retail marketing for it to ultimately reach the consumers. As I've indicated, these agribusiness supply chains or value chains are embedded within an agribusiness system. And this is, and in order for us to understand it, we need fundamentally to put a boundary around the system because there are so many things that we need to think about and some of which are controllable and some of which are not. By thinking about things in a systems perspective, we're able then to look at how effectively then we can manage the chain. And I'm going to raise then one of the rhetorical questions that I'll answer a little bit later for you. Who manages the chain? This is a fundamental issue within these value chains. If we're going to deliver superior value to customers at least cost, someone within this value chain needs to coordinate it. Someone needs to manage the chain. Who is that person? Who is that actor who actually manages that chain? I'll get you to think about that 
We'll answer a little bit later. We also need to acknowledge that the agribusiness chains are embedded within a socio-political and socio-economic environment. That is, the context is actually going to impact and influence the performance of the chain. So for this reason, the performance of agribusiness chains in Indonesia are different to the performance of agribusiness chains in Australia. They're very different because of the environment and the levels of economic development within which our chains operate. It's also going to be governed by the type of actors that are actually working within our chain. And the socioeconomic drivers here as they impact, again, consumers' demands and expectations, particularly around things like household income and demands hence for food safety and things like environment, environmental protection, inclusion, gender, etc. But of course, what we need to acknowledge and accept that within agribusiness value chains is that the farm production particularly is governed by the agrological environment within which we're actually located. And again, as you would accept and acknowledge that Indonesia is a far more tropical country, although yes, the northern part of Australia is tropical. Where I am, we're more temperate here in, in sort of Western Australia and certainly Southwest Western Australia. So again, the type of ecological climate and the environment within which we're operating is going to impact on that food system. We also need to acknowledge what actually happens within the food system itself and within the value chain. Clearly, product is going to move from production to consumption. But information is going to flow in the reverse direction. What consumers are telling their customers and in turn what customers are telling farmer is going to determine what is produced, how much is produced, what and when it's produced. But as we can also see along the system, because of the fact that communication and information systems are not always operating to the way that we would want them, there is going to be waste. But we're also dealing with production that as a consequence of the agrological environment within which we're embedded, product is not necessarily going to conform to the standards of our customers. And so when we produce bananas, for example, a certain proportion or number or range of those bananas are not going to meet the expectations of consumers. They're going to be rejected. And so managing and handling waste within this food system is one of the key issues that, currently, that we currently face with around 30% of food production being wasted. So this is, for our food systems, a major issue that, that we need to resolve. But in order to resolve it, we need to collectively address it along the entire value chain. We can't address it just at one single step or, or stage of the chain. And so clearly, this concept of a value chain, of being customer-driven rather than supply-driven, is going to bring about a significant change in the way in which we think. We're going to see a shift in the focus then from production to marketing. And I think I spoke about this in one of the earlier presentations when we talk about much of the innovation and the interventions that have actually been made to our farming systems to improve technology. But part of the improvement of that technology is, again, ensuring that we've got the linkage to market. Because unless we're actually seeing then a positive end benefit to the farmers as a result of that new technology, it's not going to be adopted. And that's the risk and, and the need then to actually link smallholder farmers to market. That's the critical thing. And so again, we see within much even of the FAO and UN thinking is that we need to spend as much time concerning ourselves with the marketing of the product than we actually do about the production. Because if the two are not aligning, as we see here, we've got this huge problem of food waste and thus also the waste of resources, the chemicals, the seeds, the fertilizers and all the inputs that we've actually utilized to produce that product only to dispose of it in a manner that is basically a waste. We haven't exploited the resources to the extent that we should. The fundamental concept, of course, around marketing is that the sole reason for the existence of any business is to satisfy its downstream needs better than its competitors. And that's part of then what actually drives our thinking. 
we need to think about customer satisfaction as being the key variable that actually impacts and influences the decisions that we make at a production level. And that requires a quantum shift in the way in which smallholder farmers currently think. Because in most cases, smallholder farmers do not have access to the market information that they actually need to make those informed decisions. And so when we talk about the concept then of marketing, we recognize that there are three key words. Customer is king. What customer wants, customer gets. And as we've seen a moment ago, the whole reason for our existence then as a business is to be able to meet those customer needs better than our competitors. It's this need to satisfy our customers, which is the principal driver for our business. And that is one of the key differences in thinking that is so necessary to be able to bring smallholder farmers into modern agribusiness. And so, answering the question that I posed to you a moment ago, who is it then that manages the value chain? If we assume that the customer is king and the customer then has a legitimate right to command, then quite clearly it is the customer who is making that decision. It is the customer who is making the, the key decisions around how the agribusiness value chain is actually going to operate. And of course, if we're going to assume that, we assume now that the customer has power. That's inherent, isn't it? That if we're going to give the customer, if we acknowledge the customer's right to command, then we're also by default giving that power. And here we need to acknowledge that the power is not always negative because power is the means by which these value chains are coordinated. And hence, by then giving power to the customers, the power to coordinate the chain, the suppliers to those value chains must make choices. And this becomes a really important consideration in the way in which these value chains work. Because particularly within a country like Indonesia, we need to acknowledge that we indeed have what we can describe here as a dual marketing system. There are what we describe as in suppliers, but there are also those people who we describe as out suppliers. So if I, as a small producer of fresh fruit and vegetables, or perhaps a producer of eggs or of chicken meat, or a producer of fish, or indeed even a producer of, of suppy, of beef, if I want to deal, for example, with restaurants, if I want to deal with McDonald's, or if I want to deal with Burger King, or indeed if I want to deal with Hero, I'm going to have to do what Hero tell me to do. And so if I do what they say, I become an in supplier. I'm one of the people that will actually be capable of supplying the customers. But if I choose not to adopt the quality systems and the way of business that are demanded by the consumer, then I become an out supplier. Out suppliers clearly do not comply. And as a result then of an out supplier, I'm going to have to continue to deal and to continue to trade in the traditional wet market where I have very little feedback and very little certainty on a day-to-day -day business about the way my business operates. Whereas I'm dealing, whereas if I'm dealing with a food processor or a food manufacturer, like for example, McDonald's, or if I'm dealing with a retailer like Hero, there's a certain element of predictability to the way in which my business operates. And with that degree of predictability, as we spoke about on the previous occasion with risk and uncertainty, I can now make the business decisions that will actually support and facilitate my capacity and ability to meet the needs of my downstream suppliers. And, that, and, and that's ultimately what we're wanting to do. And here comes the point that I guess I've already started to make on a number of occasions, that with the exception perhaps of fresh fruit and vegetables, fish, eggs, and, and you know, it's probably just about it, 
very few producers are actually selling direct to consumers. That is, there's a process by which the food is actually transformed from the time that it leaves the, the farm gate to the time that it is actually consumed. And if we take this example, of course, here from Western Australia, we don't, you as a consumer in Indonesia, you don't eat wheat, but we produce the raw product. We then send that wheat to Indonesia to Bogasari, probably the largest flour mill in the world. Bogasari then supply that flour to Indofood. And Indofood in turn will produce the, the, the noodles that, that you consume. Or indeed, they'll provide that flour then to, for example, Holland Bakery and or any of the other bakeries operating within Indonesia to produce bread and other snack food products. So we need to appreciate, we need to understand then that there is this process by which food is transformed. And so as a result of that, as farm producers, the decisions that we make are actually based around what we call derived demand. It's not primary demand, it's derived demand. So in other words, you could say from the point of view of the demand for beef, the demand for, for beef is driven in part by the demand for meat patties, which of course go into the hamburgers that you consume from McDonald's and or from Burger King. That's the derived demand. So if we so the more hamburgers that McDonald's and or Burger King sell, the more the demand for beef at the farm level. But again, the beef that is supplied then from the farm level and from the fattening units is then going to be processed into those hamburger patties that are used by McDonald and Burger King as the critical ingredient in those hamburgers that I know Indonesians so much enjoy. And it's the same sort of thing that we see occurring throughout our entire system. It is this derived demand, what is happening at the consumer level, then that is actually driving the demand through the rest of the value chain. We also need to accept and to acknowledge with the two examples given here, that wheat is not wheat. As an ingredient, the wheat that we, the flour that Indofood used to make noodles is very, very different to the flour that Holland Bakery is going to use to make either bread and cakes and or cookies. And so we need to understand here that when we start talking to and dealing with these institutional markets, we need to understand this concept of quality. This concept of quality is fundamental to everything that we do. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what we also need to appreciate is what is it that the market intermediaries actually perform? What roles is it that they actually do? Because so often that we hear in agricultural value chains is that in order to improve the efficiency of the chain, in order to get the farmers to make more, we need to reduce market intermediaries. Well, the reality is we can't necessarily do that. What we need to do here is we need to understand what the market intermediaries do, because if farmers are going to, again, participate in these agribusiness value chains, they need to perform some of these functions themselves. And so this concept of what a market intermediary is becomes quite complex. And when you start to see in a moment what these market intermediaries do, that's going to create a whole lot of problems, of course, for smallholder farmers. As we see here, market intermediaries are involved with the transportation and storage of product. Hmm, smallholder farmers generally don't do much of that. And even where they do store the product, it's not necessarily in the ideal condition. So we get a lot of product deterioration and, and, and damage due to rodents and, and pests and diseases and all sorts of problems. The market intermediaries operate, of course, at both ends of the chain. When we think about traders and collector agents working in the rural areas, they're actually accumulating bulk. By visiting and talking to several smallholder farmers, they're collecting the produce which that they will then take from, say, a production area in Malang, and they're going to transport that to the point of consumption in Semarang. You're then going to sell the product to a distributor. 
the distributor will then break that bulk down in terms of supplying in multiple retailers, small stores, warongs, etc. So you've got at one end of the scale, market intermediaries accumulating bulk, but at the other end, they're actually breaking bulk. The other part of the market intermediaries function is cr create an assortment. People just don't want to purchase kintung, for example, potato. People want potato and onions and carrots and kung kun and pak choy and choy sum and garlic and shallot. So we have to create an assortment. That's part of the role of the market intermediary to do that. The market intermediary is also responsible for providing market intelligence, providing and supporting customers, because of course the farmers are in the rural areas. Who's going to support the farmers in the urban areas where the food is consumed? Of course, the market intermediaries also provide the credit because there's often a period during which product is then sold to the market, to, to retailers, for example, but the retailers don't pay their suppliers. And indeed, this is one of the key problems in dealing with some of these institutional markets, particularly in terms of dealing, for example, with the supermarkets. The supermarkets don't pay cash on delivery. The supermarkets will pay on average at about 60 days. So for a smallholder producer who is generally used to cash on delivery, what happens? How then does that smallholder farmer get paid while he waits for the money to come from the supermarket? It's a key issue. It's a key problem. I also want you to appreciate again what is one of the fundamental things that we need to understand about value chains. A firm does not sell to a market intermediary. A firm sells through a market intermediary. I'm not playing on words here. It's a key change again in concept and in thinking. So our market intermediary becomes our partner. So again, we need to appreciate and understand that as a farmer, it is our role within the value chain to produce. We use market intermediaries to do the subsequent distribution of our product so we can focus on what we do within the value chain. But if there's going to be a partnership, then we actually need to treat our market intermediary as a partner. And that means we need to form these enduring long-term relationships with our market intermediaries, where these relationships, as we'll talk a moment ago, uh, well, we'll talk later rather, will be based around things like trust, satisfaction, commitment, and the making of relationship-specific investments. So in other words, what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to support our market intermediary. We're going to listen to our market intermediary. So what our market intermediary tells us to do in terms of the quality and the type of products that we need to produce, that we are in a position to be able to respond to the needs of those customers. So again, it's a change in concept and a way of thinking. We need to work together to get our products to market. So we don't sell to, we sell through. And that means we need to understand who our customers' customers are. In other words, the closer that we can get to the ultimate consumer, then the more the information is that we're going to have to enable us again to make informed decisions. And so we need to ensure that in terms of this partnership, the margins that our market intermediaries extract are adequate, that they are sufficient for that market intermediary to perform. And this is a point that I so often find myself being engaged with in talking to government, where government says, get rid of the market intermediaries, have the farmers sell direct to customers, it'll be so much better for the farmers. Yes, in terms of price, but can the farmers perform all of the functions here that we spoke about a moment ago. No, they can't. And so then because we have to deal with market intermediaries, we have to ensure that the market intermediaries are making money. We cannot deny them the opportunity to make money. And certainly the issue that we see within a country like Australia is that every time we actually sell through a market intermediary, 
we're going to add about 20% or between 20 to 25% to the actual cost of the product. So as you can see, we only need to deal with three market intermediaries and our product is now twice the price that it was before. And so there are a whole lot of issues here around things like establishing exclusive territories, Salesforce training, market research assistance, and indeed business advisory services where market intermediaries and producers actually need to learn to work together. So please, there's a couple of take home messages today. This concept of value chain versus supply chain. Customer is king. And with customer of king comes the fact that we now delegate the power to the customers to control or co coordinate the value chain. And this concept of a partnership of not selling to our market intermediaries, but indeed selling through them so that we mutually benefit from the relationship. But what is it that our downstream customers require? And I'll get you to think about this. Which is the most important of these criteria? Consistent quality, reliable delivery, competitive price, or service? I would imagine that most of you have said that in terms of dealing with of market intermediaries or customers, the most important thing is competitive price. I'm sorry, you'd be wrong. It's not. You see, from a customer's perspective, what the customer wants is consistent quality. They have to be able to know that week after week after week, you will deliver what they want to the quality that they want, and you will deliver reliably and consistently. Now, if you can do these things, then we'll talk about price. So consistent quality and reliable delivery are in fact the most important attributes that our industrial customers actually look for. Then we'll talk about price and then we'll talk about service. We'll talk about the things that you can do for me and the things that I'll do for you to actually build and enhance this partnership, this relationship. But I need you to understand what consistent quality is. And when we talk about consistent quality, quality does not mean best. So here's another takeaway message for you. Quality does not mean best. In the food industry, quality means fitness for purpose. And the fitness for purpose is going to depend upon how the customer intends to use the product. So that if you think for one moment, and I'll bring you back to that example of a hamburger. Think about the quality of the meat that's going into that hamburger. Are you eating prime fillet or rump beef? No. You're probably eating some poor old dairy cow who has reached her use-by date and she's been processed in, a, in an abattoir, but the meat is not of restaurant quality that that meat is it's exceptionally good for the production of hamburger patties. Again, I show you the example of kentung, potato. If you're going to produce kentung krepik, companies like Indofood are going to use a variety called Atlantic because Atlantic delivers what Indofood are looking for in terms of the product specification. But when we're growing potatoes for McDonald's and potatoes for Burger King, we use another variety called Russet Burbank. Both Russet Burbank and Atlantic have higher specific gravities, which means that they absorb less fat, which means that the potato stays crisp and crunchy. But yet, if you put either Russet Burbank and or Atlantic into a rendang, now, I know that's not normal, but hey, I make lots of rendang, but I don't make my rendang from sapi. I make it from kamping, goat. And then just before it's ready to, to be consumed, I'll throw in a couple of potatoes. But I want the potato to keep its shape and to keep its form. That's a very different outcome 
to what it is that our institutional users want. And so here comes the key consideration that when we think about quality, we need to know how the customer intends to use the product because the product specifications, the technical specifications are different. Just like I spoke about at the outset with wheat and the difference between wheat flour to make noodles and wheat flour to make, for example, bakery products. Reliable delivery, of course, means delivering the product when the customer wants it. And that's going to bring about a whole lot of things around things like, for example, production scheduling. So again, as we talked about this concern about reliable and consistent delivery, we need to be able to think about how we can maintain the consistency of supply week after week after week after week. We need to think about being able to store it so that we can again enhance it beyond the season of supply. We need to think too about the transport and logistics about how we're actually going to get the product from the farm to the customer at the time the customer wants it. And this becomes particularly critical in terms of dealing with, for example, the supermarkets where you have very clearly specified delivery times during which you must deliver to that distribution warehouse. And if you do not deliver at that time, you will be penalized. And these fines are significant. We also need to talk about a whole range of things around things like ordering and invoicing, and particularly the importance here of what is called electronic data interchange, EDI. So electronic data interchange, EDI, the capacity for our systems to actually talk. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit further down the track. We also need to talk a little bit about price. Of course, we need to acknowledge that production costs are going to determine the floor price. And fundamentally, we cannot sell below the floor price without incurring a loss. So our objective then as a firm is to make sufficient income to obviously offset our production costs, but we also need to make a profit. We need to be able to generate a fair return, which is commensurate with the amount of risk that we have taken. And for those of you, I think you tuned into one of my, well, in fact, my first presentation, I introduced the concept of what was called the Boston Consulting Group Matrix where we talked about the product life cycle and we recognized the importance that products generally decline. So part of this whole issue then around production costs is understanding that we need to be profitable so that we can actually invest a certain proportion of our profit into innovation, into improving performance in the long term because markets are constantly changing. And so products themselves, are coming and going, depending upon, of course, the needs of the downstream customers. We also need to acknowledge that the production costs at the farm level are going to be impacted by what we call the experience curve. And the experience curve brings with it this thing called the economies of scale. And the economies of scale basically mean that every time production doubles, we're going to get benefits of between 20 to 30, I'm sorry, of between 10 to 30%. So this is the things associated with the economies of scale. Every time production doubles, we're going to get efficiencies of between 10 to 30%. So if we're producing one unit, it's going to cost us a dollar. If we produce two units, it's probably going to cost us 70 cents. If we produce four units, it's probably going to cost us 63 cents. If we produce eight units, it's going to cost 57 cents. If we produce 16 units, it's going to cost 54 cents. Now, the other thing that you can see happening here is what we call diminishing returns. And that's really also important to acknowledge that as we do get bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder and harder to actually generate any new economies of scale. But the economies of scale in part are generated by technology at the farm level, but also by technology at the processing level. And so if we look, for example, at coffee prices on a world basis, and I understand, of course, that Indonesia is a major producer of coffee, one of the reasons for the decline in prices over time is the improvement in processing technology that allows companies like Nestle now to take 
poor quality coffee to actually produce a better quality product. We also see emerging from this concept of competitive price is vertical integration. The capacity again for the companies within the value chain to cooperate and to collaborate. And that is going to again, result in significant improvements. But what we must understand in terms of pricing is the value that the consumer places on the actual benefits themselves. And I'm going to contrast that, that with these two examples that I give you. As you can see here on the left, Retailer one is pushing price. It's cheap, cheap, cheap. That's the objective here. We're selling fundamentally on price. The lower it is, the, the more product we're gonna sell. But that's not always true. Because on the right, now we have product that has been differentiated, where the product is being sold in the market on the fact that it is fresher, in terms of the fact that it is superior quality, but it's also local. And so we now have consumers who are actually prepared to pay more for the product because it's better quality, because it tastes better, and it's local product. So the benefits now are actually going back to support local producers. The money is staying within the local economy. And so we need to understand that not Low price is not important to everyone. There are these other mechanisms by which we can differentiate our product in the market. And hence this concept of value. What is value? And so that's going to bring us back to think about some of these issues in a moment. What is customer service? We spoke about these four drivers, consistent quality, reliable delivery, competitive price, customer service. Customer service describes the extra thing that a supplier is willing to do to retain the business. And this often means things like providing technical assistance or training programs. And let's give you an example here that uh, one of the products that we export from Western Australia is live lobster. So when we export the live lobster and it goes to a restaurant, we have to work, then work with the restaurant to train them and to teach them how to handle a live lobster so that when it arrives in their store, they can place it in the tank and the lobster will actually survive. Because if the lobster is dead, we are actually selling live lobster. A dead lobster has no value. So that's where we actually work. The example that I show you here is some of my colleagues at the Australian Export Grain Innovation Centre actually working with udon noodles. So again, what we're actually doing here is taste testing. We're testing the product in Australia to see if we can find better combinations of wheat and products that will actually help our downstream customers deliver superior product to their consumers. It also means talking to our customers. So customer service means basically in one word or two words, <laughs> no surprises. So if we've got a production problem that's going to impact our capacity and our ability to meet our customers' need, the first thing we do is pick up the phone and talk to our customer and we tell them that we have a problem. We don't just surprise them. Because if we tell our customer that we have a problem, our customer then can actually look at ways and means of being able to respond. They can look for alternative suppliers. It's very, very important to understand this concept then of customer service. So as I indicated to you a moment ago, well, what is this concept of value? What is it? Well, value is the amount of money that something is worth. Value is the price that we're prepared to pay for something. We can also look at value as being the fair return or the equivalent in terms of goods or services for money that something is exchanged. So the key point here when we look at value is this concept of fairness, this concept of equity. And as I've alluded to a number of times before, this is where a lot of government people come in and get concerned about ensuring that smallholder farmers get a better share of the price, but without understanding the role that market intermediaries play. But yet consumers clearly acknowledge 
the fact that if they deal directly with consumers, uh, sorry, with producers, they can actually get a greater proportion of that money back to the farmers. We can also describe value in terms of the relative worth or the utility or the importance. So if we start to look at our cup of coffee here, for example, well, what is the relative worth of that cup of coffee? Does it matter if the price of coffee goes up? No, because consumers are gonna drink that cup of coffee irrespective, I need the caffeine. But what we also, when we buy that coffee, what we're also fundamentally interested in, firstly and foremostly, is taste. And that's what value then is described as, it's the taste. But we can also start to think about when, where, and how we actually consume coffee. So for example, I can buy 200 grams of coffee for about $3.50 or $4.50 from the supermarket. 200 grams. But yet if I go to a cafe, I'm going to pay 300, I'm going to pay $3.50 for just one cup of coffee. Now that's that's not good value, is it, when you think about it from the point of view that I bought 200 grams for 350 and I've just bought one cup for 350. So why did I pay 350? Because again, it's that utility. It's the time and place that adds value. So value is a complex construct, but we really need to appreciate and understand it to look then as to how we can add value. But when we talk about value, value for whom? Is it value for the smallholder farmer? Is it value for the processor? Is it value for the retailer? Is it value for the consumer? Or is it indeed, and we should be thinking more sustainably again, given the SDGs, what about our impact or the environment? What about the impact on the earth, the planet itself? Value for whom? This is one of the key drivers that needs to, to, to impact and, to, and drive our influence here. So as I've suggested a moment ago, when we start talking about value, you can see that it's about time, it's about place, it's about cost, it's about reducing wastage, and it's about maximising the quality. And this is what we talk when we get into this concept of quality. It's about delivering to customers' expectations. But I also want to introduce a new concept to you. I want you to think for one moment of that hamburger. And I want you to think for one moment about the number of products that are actually involved in bringing you that hamburger. We've got the bun, we've got the patty, we've got the tomato, we've got the lettuce, we've got the cheese. We've got the mayonnaise, we've got the salt and pepper, we've got the cooking oil, we've got the paper that it's wrapped in, the serviette, the napkin, we've got the paper box or the cardboard box within to which this hamburger goes. So if you start thinking about your hamburger in this perspective, there's not one, there's not two, there's not three, but there's probably anything between 10 to 12 supply chains involved in bringing you that hamburger. And so when we start to think about value here, it's how then these value chain activities are carried out that's going to determine costs and indeed affect profits. So for a company like McDonald's, it's about how well they can manage and coordinate all for the supply chains that are necessary to bring you that hamburger. And just as we see here with this example of coffee, it's about understanding how the coffee is harvested, how the coffee is processed, and indeed here in Papua New Guinea, how we do the tasting of the coffee prior to export to ensure that we deliver them the standards as would the consumer expect in terms of taste. So here comes again, this key, variable that it's about coordinating the activities of these value chains. And it was Porter who way back in, in 1985 talked about this general concept of a value chain. Where Porter talked about this concept of 
understanding what it is that the value chain does in terms of our inbound logistics, the operations and processing, our outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and of course, the service component. But in order for the firm to undertake these activities, these primary activities, we need to have the infrastructure. We need to have the human resource management. In other words, we need to have the people that are adequately trained. We need the technology and we need the procurement. That is, we need to be able to deal with suppliers who can be able to deliver us what we want reliably and consistently. And as we've started to see also, add to that these environmental concerns that in other words, that they are producing, for example, under good agricultural practice or good aquaculture practice or good veterinary practice. They are being responsible in terms of what they actually do. So what emerges then from all of this discussion thus far then is that in order for us then to be able to compete and to, and to be able to operate within the market here, we need to find ways of competing and to do that, we need to allocate and utilize resources in a way that is harder for others to contest and to replicate. And as you can see here, we can do this through adding more value. We can do it through reducing cost, or we can do it by being more responsive than our competitors. But we can also do it by being more uh, responsible and this is where we see some of these environmental, economic and social dimensions coming in. And for most of you, I doubt if you are even aware of the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. The Sustainable Agriculture Initiative was born out of the demand by many of the world's largest food processors to actually be seen as being environmentally responsible. Good agricultural practice contributes to this, but there's more than, than that alone. So let's get then to what's what some of the implications then for producers. I am conscious of the time, Sui. I can see you sitting there. What we need to acknowledge within agribusiness value chains is that we're actually dealing with fewer, larger, and more sophisticated farm input suppliers, finance and service sector organizations, primary processors and manufacturers, customers, retailers, and food savers, food service firms. In other words, the environment as we saw before in that very first or second slide was about acknowledging the changes that are actually occurring within agribusiness value chains. The consolidation and aggregation that's occurring within the chains is significant. And I want you to just for one moment, look at this and shudder. These are the 10 major food producers. Look at Mondelez. Look at the number of brands. Look at the portfolio that Mondelez controls. Look at Coca-Cola and PepsiCo. Look at the number of brands that they actually control in the market. Look at Nestle. Look at Unilever. Look at British Associated Food or Associated British Foods. The portfolio of brands and things that are held by these major food processing companies is massive. But so also is the global share that's held by the retailers. Look at Walmart. Walmart's turnover is 526 US billion per year, 526 billion in turnover. If you look at Walmart and you then add Costco, Kroger, Schwartz and Aldi, you're still not as big as Walmart. Then you've got Carrefour, Tesco, 7-Eleven, Boiler, Holt, and of course, Orshan. So what we see is concentration also at the retail level. So we've got concentration in food processing, concentration in retail, but we don't have any concentration or aggregation at the farm level. And of course, that creates part of the problem then in terms of smallholder farmers participating in these agribusiness value chains. 
And so as a result then of the concentration and aggregation that we actually see then within these agribusiness supply chains, our customers are more demanding in terms of their quality expectation. And so as you recall earlier, we spoke then about suppliers having to make choices. I'm either going to be an in supplier, in which case I'm going to comply, or I'm going to be an out supplier. In other words, I choose not to comply. And if I choose not to comply, then I'm going to be stuck, for example, in the traditional wet market. We also see, particularly at a retail level, this increasing desire for, for retailers to enter into what are basically described as own labels, where they can force food manufacturers and food processors to deliver private labels, which effectively then the food processors have no ownership of. And indeed, for the retailers themselves to engage in new product innovations. So we need to acknowledge then, as we did right up front, that if we assume from the beginning that this concept of marketing is what drives the value chain, and we are value chain driven rather than supply trade chain driven, and the customer therefore has the power because our marketing theory gives the power to the customer. Customers therefore have the authority effectively to reject poor product quality to impose penalties for non-delivery and to su require suppliers to invest in things like production, capacity, infrastructure, quality assurance systems, and these electronic data interchange systems that enable the retailers and the suppliers to actually communicate. And so certainly then, from a smallholder farmer's perspective, if we're going to be able to engage with these modern markets, with these food processors and with these retailers, smallholder farmers have to learn to collaborate. Now, there are multiple ways of doing this through cooperacy, through clusters, through companies, through associations. I don't care how it's done, but smallholder farmers must learn to cooperate if we're going to be able to deal with modern value chains. Because smallholder farmers operating on their own are simply too small. They don't have the capacity and the ability to be able to meet the needs of those downstream customers. And by learning to work together, smallholder farmers are able to improve their bargaining power. They're able to engage in processing and as we've seen to capture a greater share of the value. And there are therefore financial incentives in terms of their capacity to be able to gain from the financial outcomes. So by working together, you've got the efficiencies emerging through the economies of scale, particularly in transport and logistics. By again, establishing these relationships with downstream customers, we're going to get improved access to market information. But by working together, we're in a much better position to be able to meet the needs of our downstream customers in terms of consistent supply and good quality product. But it also works at the other end. By working together, we can actually negotiate better terms of trade for the various inputs that we need in terms of the chemicals, the seeds, the fertilizers, the young chicks, the, the fingerlings for, for aquaculture. And it also improves our access to technology which is critically important, of course, for smallholder farmers to be able to improve productivity. But in order to reduce this risk and uncertainty, we need to build these enduring long-term relationships with customers. Firms establish these long-term relationships with exchange partners because it is more efficient and effective. It reduces what we call the transaction costs. And there are transaction costs associated with searching and evaluating potential suppliers and customers. There are the transaction costs themselves as to whether or not I'll get paid or won't get paid. And of course, as we spoke last time, it's about reducing risk. Where we work through relationships, we get improved access to markets. We get improved access to market information and production inputs. We get improved product quality and performance and we get greater support from our customers in terms of launching new products. 
So to very, very briefly talk about these relationships, well, what comprises them? Well, again, the key dimensions here are satisfaction, trust, and commitment. Trust is all about, of course, the social relationship that we actually develop between one another, the confidence that we place in our upstream suppliers and our downstream customers to do the right thing by us. And we commit then to that relationship, just as we do to uh, a, a wedding partner or a, um, our, our, you know, our, our spouse. And of course, there are these relationship-specific investments, as we've seen, the need for us to actually work together to be able to meet the needs of those downstream customers. And final slide, given that I realise I'm right out of time, is to talk about the need to implement quality management systems. In order to engage with these downstream customers, we're going to need to implement quality management systems. And again, this is a change in thinking, a quantum shift in the way in which, again, businesses have operated, where we need to think about controlling quality through the process of design, shipment, and service to prevent unsatisfactory quality from arising in the first place. So our objective here is to build quality in rather to inspect quality out. This is the really key consideration here. Sorry, I'm going to be naughty. I'm going to jump to do extra slides because I think this is really important. To understand quality, we need to appreciate that there are two costs here. There's the cost of controlling quality, but there's the cost of failing to control quality. The costs that are involved in controlling quality result around such things as prevention costs, that is things like quality planning, but we also have the appraisal costs where associated with inspection and testing and certification. But the costs of failing to control are much, much greater in terms of the internal failure costs that we see in terms of things like scrap or spoilage, but also the significant damage that we have in terms of external failure costs, in terms of product recall, customer complaints, reduced sales, and the loss of goodwill. So if we actually do what we've suggested here, we actually we plan to produce product that meets customer specifications by looking at how we can produce better quality product, we actually get to the situation of being able to prevent poor quality product being produced in the first place rather than simply inspecting it out. So that's going to require then smallholder farmers to implement a range of quality management systems that not only look at the technical specifications, but also, of course, look at the environmental and equity implications of those sorts of decisions. So thank you and my apologies for sort of taking a little bit longer than I expected or an anticipated. But we're basically at a point in time now where we can return to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Peter, for delivering such informative and interesting presentation. What I really like from this presentation that opened my mind is uh, what Peter say about the role of market intermediaries. A firm does not sell to a market intermediary, it sells through it. That statement really helps me to untie my confusion about uh, the contradictive condition. We believe that uh, farmers should sell directly to consumer. Uh, well, uh, on the other hand, supply chain encourage several marketing elements to collaborate in the chain. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the second session, the Q&A session. And we already received a lot of questions, but I like to choose three questions from the participants for the first session. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, the first question is from Sharif Imam Hidayat. 
hmm, Sya- Bapak Syarif Imam Hidayat, uh, would you like to ask directly to Peter? Prof. Sarif Imam Hidayat, are you still here? No? Maybe I... Let me address the question anyway. Okay. I'm happy to do that. How to reduce agribusiness market risk and the factors affecting a market distortion? Clearly, one of the key things that we're trying to do, as we've indicated, is we want to shift away from the general transactional marketing that occurs, of course, within the transitional economies. From the majority of smallholder farmers, what you're currently involved in at the moment is selling to wet markets. And in selling to wet markets, the prices are changing every day, every hour, and even within the hour, of course, because as the market draws to its conclusion, particularly for fresh process, well, for fresh product, it's got to be disposed of, otherwise it's dumped. That's where much of the risk comes from. But by then engaging with institutional users, with things like food processors, with restaurants and institutional food users and with supermarkets, supermarkets need that consistent and reliable delivery. And so by engaging then with these sorts of downstream customers, we actually reduce the price risk because we actually know then in advance what price we're actually going to get for the product over an extended period of time. And it's that knowledge, it's that certainty of price over time that actually allows us then to make the investments that are necessary in things like packing sheds, in improved transport and logistics, returnable plastic crates, and other things to improve and or enhance, for example, the shelf life. It also gives us then the opportunity through those investments to look at how we can become more efficient and effective actually in farm production as well. So that's one of the key reasons then for actually engaging in these enduring long-term relationships is that it is a risk mitigation strategy. It reduces the uncertainty of price. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, This question is pretty much related with the last meeting about agriculture in uh, the risk management in agriculture. Okay, we move to the second question. Uh, Wait a minute. Okay, the second question is from Firman from Universitas Pajajaran. How to link smallholder farmer to market with high food standardization? As we know that smallholder farmer doesn't have a knowledge about it. Again, is Pak Furman available or do I, I'll, I'll launch straight into it. How to link smallholder farmers to market? This, this becomes the, the critical role, as I, as I spoke about, in terms of cooperasi, fundamentally. I know this is difficult. I know that cooperasi has have, have a bad history within Indonesia. But fundamentally, this is what has to happen. But what we need to do in order to make it happen is that we need to get the smallholder farmers to appreciate themselves why they come together. And it's by bringing the smallholder farmers together in a different way, in a different manner, and actually doing it in a way and in a manner that builds capacity among the smallholder farmers. Now, in much of the work that we've been undertaking in, we did some work in Indonesia, but most of it was in the Philippines with Caritas, uh, of course, one of the international aid agencies. But Caritas used what they call an eight-step plan for agro-enterprise development. And this plan involves engaging with the smallholder farmers as a group within a community or within a village, a kampong, for the smallholder farmers to actually understand what their key problems are and then to get those farmers to recognise that if they actually work together, there is a solution. So we get them to drive 
the cooperative process rather than it being driven by government. So where government, for example, offers incentives and approaches, forces the farmers into cooperative, the reasons for the formation of the cooperative are wrong. But if we get the farmers to appreciate themselves why they're doing it and to see the benefits, that brings actually about the, the process. And that's why we tend to use certainly within the Philippines a concept of what we call clustering rather than cooperacy, because clustering is a new term, it's a clean term, but it's something that the farmers readily adjust to. But even then, for these clusters to work, we have to educate, we have to spend time building the capacity within the smallholder farmers in terms of marketing and understanding what they can do and what they need to do to meet those needs of downstream customers. So much of what I've spoken about today in terms of product quality, reliable delivery, competitive price, service, these are all the things that I'll talk to the smallholder farmers about so that they understand the benefits then of cooperation. Of cooperation. And once we get them working together, then that's how we link them then to those institutional users. Once we've got them linked, that then is when we start to introduce the quality management systems. And the quality management systems are generally built in the first instance around GAP, good agriculture practice. Good, good agriculture practice is fundamentally about assuring food safety, but it's also about environment and equity. Okay, thank you, Peter. It's good to mention about cooperacy. Uh, I agree with you that in Indonesia, cooperacy seems like to have a bad image. Uh, so our farmers doesn't really like to uh, join with cooperacy anymore. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we maybe we move to the last question for this session. Uh, this is from Khairul Asharina Sution from Universitas Diponegoro. Uh, during this pandemic era, we as a producer know that our business didn't go well in the market. How do we satisfy the customer and keep our business going on and stabilize? stabilize? Okay. Again, I think I've, I actually dealt with this question uh, indirectly in my very first presentation. Um, around marketing alternatives and direct marketing. We need, we need to acknowledge that in moving the product from, from farm to plate, there are effectively two key distribution strategies, what we call direct distribution and or indirect distribution, where we use the market intermediaries. There is much of a push for farmers to go more direct, but if farmers do go direct, as I talked about in the presentation today, we need to understand the role that the market intermediaries perform. And indeed, if the farmers are going to go direct, they have to perform those functions themselves. And that then becomes part of the challenge. How do farmers undertake these activities that the market intermediaries would, under, would ordinarily undertake? There are multiple forms of direct marketing but the ones that we're most often sort of familiar with are things like farmers markets. But again, acknowledge that if we're dealing with things like farmers markets, we have the same issue that again, if it's going to be cost effective, not every farmer in the Kampong should go to market because it's just not going to be cost effective. So again, if we work as a cluster, we can then nominate one or, one or more farmers to take the product from all of the farmers to the farmer's market. And we might share that activity around so that different farmers go at different times so that they also experience the market. So that's one category. Second category is selling directly to restaurants. And restaurants actually want to deal directly with smallholder farmers. But again, what restaurants fundamentally want when they deal directly with smallholder farmers is product that is safe and product that is free of chemical residues. Now, you see, here comes the issue that if farmers adopt things like, for example, good agriculture practice, when they put the product through the traditional wet markets, there's no financial incentive. There's no additional price. But if they deal directly with a restaurant, an executive chef, or where they deal directly with a, a retailer, a supermarket, the supermarket is able to 
differentiate the product in the market and achieve a higher price. And that's what then drives the adoption of these more sustainable farming systems. So taking, for example, some work we did in the, uh, the Philippines and Mindanao with the smallholder farmers, I actually took the smallholder farmers to market. We had a Saturday within one of the major supermarkets in Davao where the farmers were behind the desk where they were selling their product. The farmers were engaging directly with the consumers. The farmers were telling the consumers what they were doing and why their product was better. They sold out. The, the consumers are going, yes, we love this product. We want more, we want more. So the, you know, these direct marketing methods are, 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 are alternatives. And of course, one of the key direct marketing methods that has certainly during COVID expanded dramatically, of course, is e-commerce, the internet, and the delivery then of basically what I call baskets or boxes of, of product. So you actually deliver, I'm sorry, you order what you want online, and then during the evening, that product is dropped off at your doorstep or to your apartment or whatever, and you pick it up in the morning, or it could even be delivered to your place of work. But certainly during COVID lockdown, it, the internet sales have, have, have absolutely skyrocketed. And so things like, again, home delivery, people could not go to restaurants. So again, there's all these things like Uber Eats and other methods or mechanisms then for delivering the food from the restaurant to the consumer's door. So e-commerce is a, is a key strategy, again, for farmers being able to engage directly with consumers. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think I get the several uh, keywords. The first is collaboration and then cluster and then direct marketing through e-commerce right yep okay very okay. good uh, maybe we can open the uh, second q and a session because there are so many questions mm, the first question or the fourth question is from gilang Kresna malik from universitas diponegoro mm. The question is why collaboration in agriculture is more important than competition, even though competition is also important to improve the quality of crop yield and the performance of the farmers. Okay. okay. Excellent question. Collaboration. We've talked here about the value chain. We've talked about reducing waste. We've talked about market information and, and, and the importance of market information flowing. Now think about, think about it from, from the perspective, and we're going to do a little bit of role playing here for a moment because this is the best way to, to demonstrate it. I work for Hero. I'm the, I'm the guy that's making the key decisions about the product that I'm going to buy to put on the shelves of Hero. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to tell you what I want. I'm not going to talk to you about when I want it and all my competitive prices or anything unless I know that I have an enduring long-term relationship. And this is where we start to see this significant benefit or improvement start to come in is that when the value chain actors actually start to collaborate, we see significant improvements in the way in which the chain operates. So that as producers, for example, we can actually start now to schedule our planting. We can actually, we can plant to a, you know, like a weekly schedule, knowing that we have a market that is going to buy at a certain price in three months' time. We also know what the technical specifications are. So we know that in terms of things like crop spacing or the stage at which we should be harvesting the product, we, we have the information that actually enables us to reduce waste. And hence, if we reduce waste, we reduce cost and we improve, therefore, our profitability. So you see, the more we actually compete, the, uh, I'm sorry, the more we actually collaborate with between the different actors in the value chain, the better people are able to make decisions and hence reducing the waste, improving both the efficiency and the effectiveness. But competition remains important because we're actually competing not as individual producers, but we're actually competing with other producers. 
So again, let's take the example of a, of a, or take Jaruk, for example, orange. Indonesia, orange, again, you're producing in a tropical climate, so your the Jaruk doesn't actually go orange, it goes, it stays green. So how are you going to promote that against the product that's coming in from China, that's coming in from Australia, that's coming in from South Africa, that's coming in from Egypt, or that's coming in from the US? Competition is going to be there because you're always going to have a low-cost competitor like China who will disrupt the market. And just as I guess as President Trump has been, you know, mouthing off for, for months, you know, this is the China flu. It's not COVID. It's the China flu. The, 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 the issue with China is that their costs of production are so low that they, send, they, they establish the benchmark. But why is it that product from Australia can still compete against product from China? Because we differentiate our product. We add value to our product. But to add value to our product, we need to collaborate with our suppliers and, and, and with our customers. Because by collaborating with our customers, we get to know what our customers want and thus the quality standards and specifications. We also get to know when they want it, how much they want. And that, of course, is going to impact on our production standards. So you start to see that it becomes so critically important then for the, the value chain actors to collaborate. Because if you have the competition within the chain, if information is not being exchanged between the partners in the value chain, then there's going to be inefficiencies and, and losses occurring within the chain. I'm here, don't worry. Okay. Just froze. <laughs> it, did, it, did this, it did this to me yesterday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was a great question from Gilang. Uh, we realized that uh, we still need a competition, right? Because it related to the competitiveness. But in this era, it's not about the um, individual competition, but uh, as a chain competition, right? Absolutely. It's the competition but with, between the chains themselves that are important and the competition, as we've suggested, with external or with other competitors like China, for example. That's where, the, that's where it becomes critical. So, so if we think of uh, producers in Malang, for example, growing potatoes, the competition uh, here is, is imports from, for example, uh, Australia or from South Africa or, or other potato producing countries that are competing. So again, the collaboration then within Indonesia is going to build up and enable Indonesian producers to actually stay competitive so that you can differentiate on the basis that this is local product where the benefits are going to local communities rather than off to some, you know, kampong in, in China that, the, you know, the money stays in Indonesia. Okay, Peter. Uh, before we move to the next question, can I ask a question from myself? Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, as an agribusiness student, we know the three terms, right? Agribusiness system, and then supply chain and value chain. For me, they have the same goal, which is to upgrade uh, product value, while value itself is defined as utility per cost, right? Then, uh, what do you think from the conceptual perspective? Uh, are they different or originally the same thing? They have changed. And I think the key concept that I, that I alluded to at, at, at the beginning, the supply chain is different to the value chain. Okay. Supply chains are production driven. So farmers who are in, in a supply chain mentality produce, 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 and don't really care about the market. And then they hope that they can sell to a market intermediary who will subsequently dispose of the product. And as I've indicated here, this is where it gets different because once we sell to the market intermediary, our job is done and we can go home to the kampong and, and you know, we can, we can have a couple of bintangs. Job is done. Let's have a beer. Woohoo! That's not the way it works with a value chain. With the value chain, we, as I've said, we don't sell to, we sell through. 
And by then selling through the market intermediary, we're hoping to access the downstream customers and consumers. Because the more we know about what it is that our customers want, then that will work its way upstream to again enable us then to make the production decisions that are necessary about what to plant, when to plant, how much to plant. So you start to see how the difference in terms of value chain, supply chain impacts on the way in which the farmers make decisions. Yes. And I then guess. of course, the value chains are embedded within a food system. Okay, I got the point. Uh, right. Supply chain is a produ producer driver, while the value chain is consumer driver. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe we move to the next question. Please. You can have your water if you want. <laughs> no, no, thank is, you. Okay. Uh, this is from Nagib from Sumedang. How? is the ideal supply chain for a developing country like Indonesia? Wonderful question, Nagib. Wonderful question. How is the ideal supply chain? I think how I would describe it is that there's going to be multiple, there's going to be multiple supply chains. Remember how I again showed you that, that initial slide when we talked about in suppliers and out suppliers. So an in supplier is someone who is making decisions about going and supplying companies like Hero and or McDonald's and or other food processors like, for example, Indofood. But the question is, if I am supplying Indofood and or Hero, what do I do with the product that is surplus to requirement? What do I do with the product that is rejected? What do I do with the product that doesn't meet their specifications? Because accidents happen they do, and product is going to be rejected. So in other words, again, think of it for one moment that, again, we have a cluster of farmers who are working together, but one of the farmers within the group applies a chemical two days before harvesting. He knows he shouldn't, but he did anyway, or, or he applied it accidentally. And so our customer then picks up a chemical residue and rejects the product. What are we going to do with that? This is the great advantage of, of actually having a dual supply chain is that by focusing on the needs of our target customers, executive chefs, food processors, food manufacturers, supermarkets, and you know things again like McDonald's and what have you, Indofood, we can actually produce product that meets their specifications with that degree of certainty and for that product that doesn't conform to specification, we've got the opportunity of disposing of that through things like the, the traditional wet market, either at a village level or indeed it could even be then at a, at a you know, further downstream. So that's what I foresee then as the ideal supply chain for a developing country like Indonesia is where you have the integration between what we basically call a high value chain which is a chain that is offering a superior quality product with all the attributes like food safety, good agriculture practice, environment, fairness and equity, gender inclusion, as opposed to a more traditional market, the wet market, that is being able to distribute food relatively cheaply and inexpensively to those members of the society or community that actually need it because not everybody in Indonesia can afford to pay the high prices for, for superior quality product. So this dualism, these two supply chains are, are from my point of view, the, the ideal situation. Okay, so the answer is to develop integration, right? Yes. Okay. And we can always, sorry, sorry, we can always go from the high value market to the lower market but it's harder to go from the lower market back up because that requires us to do different things at the production stage. Um, okay. Because of course we need the we need the quality management systems and structures that we've talked about before, and in terms of quality management systems and, and are being approved or accredited under third party quality assurance systems. Oh yes, I forgot about the quality management system. Okay. Yeah, don't forget about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we open the last station? Maybe three last question. 
Is it okay for yes. the yep. three keep, last keep question? Track. Okay. Okay, this is from Camila Nur Imania, again from Universitas Diponegoro. The current pandemic situation has caused disruption to the supply chain, so that product delivery is demanded to be on time and meet our customer needs. How do farmers or companies build supply chains that are stronger than before? Okay. I think the absolute reality again. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for the for the question. Is that again we come back to with the the issue that we were talking about again before around cooperation and clusters. We have we we cannot build better supply chains if we do not get this cooperation happening at the farm level. This is the critical component. It's only through getting smallholder farmers working together at a village level that we can actually improve the performance of the value chain because it's only then that we're going to get these long-term relationships being developed with the downstream customers that result in the improvements of technology and again our capacity and ability to form relationships with our input suppliers that will give us the technologies the improved seed the improved chemicals and fertilizers and indeed even the credit that is necessary for these value chains to actually operate so I'm sorry, I'm beginning to sound probably like a broken record. I'm going over and over and over the same thing again. But the reality is mobilizing and empowering smallholder farmers to work together. That's the only way that we can change things. It's not going to happen any other way because the market intermediaries, they can't do it. It's too expensive for the traders to go to every single farmer. And that's why within a country like Indonesia, you see the emergence of what we call the collector agents who within the community actually collect the product from other people within the community. And then the traders come to those people rather than to every individual farmer. Now, what if the community itself was to engage in this process? And then by engaging in the process, actually then develop these relationships with the downstream market intermediaries and the customers and the markets that would actually then improve the entire community. That's the, the critical thing here so that everybody within the community is actually benefiting. Okay. Yes, uh, I think uh, it's going back to the collaborative keywords, right? But it I is. think our students uh, are curious about how the mob Mobilization, because we knew that in this pandemic, we are banned everywhere, right? It's difficult to mobilize from uh, one city to another, maybe. Um, maybe you can share about uh, how is it going in Australia, maybe? About well, Australia, yes. Yeah. Australia is probably not a good example. Um, Okay. Because we're, we're probably from the point of view that we're actually out of COVID. Uh, okay. Well, I wouldn't say out of it, but we're COVID free. We've, we've, we've had 10 double donut days. Um, so in other words, no new COVID and, and no new deaths. So we're, but we are, we're probably one of the most unique countries in the world. And that's largely with the exception perhaps of New Zealand, but because of our borders, We've, and, and our governments, we, we lock down and we lock down hard. Um, and as a result of that, our community transmission was minimised. So, of course, any COVID that actually is present in, in Australia at the moment is in, in the quarantine hotels for people that have just got back. But there's nothing within the community. But nevertheless, the same, the same problems emerged, uh, Sayani, uh, in, in relation to how, as a result of the breakdowns and the lockdowns, traditional supply chains were disrupted, both in terms of international products coming in, but also, of course, then within the internal distribution of those products. And that did result, of course, in some panic buying, where for some significant period of time in Australia, you couldn't buy pasta, for example, it was gone. You couldn't even buy rice, that was gone. And you couldn't buy toilet paper that was gone because of again of the of the of the, the you know the disruptions and value chains but what's emerged as a result of that and i think this is a worldwide um, response is that people have now acknowledged the fragility of our our supply chains because they are based on the significant importation and movement of food around the world. 
And so people now are trying to re-engage with smallholder farmers. They want to get back to local. They want to get back to promoting the food that they know. To, to give you a great example from when I was recently in, um, in Malang, uh, October last year, we were talking about tempeh. Now, tempeh? Tempeh. Okay, yeah. tempeh. <laughs> tempeh. Now, as I understand, you know, Malang is recognized as being one of the best places for the manufacture of tempeh within Indonesia. And the reason for that is that the soya bean within Malang comes from local producers. So it has its own taste that allows the tempeh to, to be of a superior quality product than using the imported soybeans from the US and or Brazil. And so what you start to now see again is the consumer's preference to eat local food because local food gives them the taste and the preferences that they are familiar with and people are prepared to pay more for that than they are actually then for tempeh that is manufactured from the US and or South American imports. So you see again how you can differentiate the market and improve then farmers' returns. But for farmers to be able to do that, again, you've got to be able to get the farmers together into, into these groups so that they can be able to then produce enough of the soybean to meet the needs of the tempeh manufacturers. Okay, uh, thanks. A uh, great, uh, great answer and good um, example. So we can receive it well. Okay, maybe the last two question. The last yep. two question then. I don't mind. I'm as happy to stay here for as long as you guys do. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. Us all. From Sigit Dwi Nugroho. How can Indonesia take advantage of the trade war between China and America at the time of the new president of America, Mr. Biden? What regulations should be improved in the agribusiness sector? This is the question that Busi we already asked from the uh, previous session, right? Before we start the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, clearly, clearly, this is a this is an interest this is an interesting one because obviously, with the dispute between China and America in terms of the as you say the trade war, there are going to be gaps, and there and as these gaps emerge, then that's where basically Indonesia is going to be able to fill those gaps. Biden will probably bring to the discussions between China and America a more predictable trade environment. I would hope that's the case. From an Australian perspective at the moment, and, and you know, we're in, we're in the doghouse. China is not very comfortable with Australia because Australia was one of the first countries to say that in relation to COVID, we support this international investigation. And so because of that, China has said, naughty, naughty, naughty. We don't like Australia anymore. And so they've knocked us off in terms of barley exports. They've knocked us off in terms of wheat. They've knocked us off in terms of wine. They've knocked us off in terms of beef. And they're knocking off a whole lot of new products. You can't do that under World Trade Organization. But China's doing it. Um, so, yeah, we've all got problems with China. So, but that's not answering the question in terms of what Indonesia needs to do. What Indonesia needs to do, and the fundamental problem that you've got within Indonesia is ensuring that you have what we describe as an appropriate enabling environment. And this comes back then to, again, the, the very things that we've actually talked about today. If you're going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities, for example, in the Chinese market, in other words, exporting product from um, Indonesia to either China or to the US or, or to any other country for that matter, you're going to have to meet the requirements. That's, you know, these things that we call the SPSSs, the, phyto, the phytosanitary requirements. To be able to fill, fill the phytosanitary requirements, your exporters are going to need to work with the farmers. The farmers need to know what their obligations are in terms of exporting particularly in terms of, in relation to, again, the standards, in terms of the product specifications, the quality standards, 
but most specifically the issues around things like agricultural chemicals, what you can and cannot apply. For example, into Japan, there is what they call the, the black list or a prohibited list. There's something like about 240 agricultural chemicals that are on that list. When Japan talks about chemicals on that list, the chemicals on that list are not permitted, period. We're not talking about residue limits here. They are not permitted, period. So you see what that does, and this is where it gets really interesting and reinforces some of the key points then within value chain management then is traceability. And I'll give you an example. During the time that we were working again with these value chains and improving the value chains in um, Mindanao, we undertook a shipment of mangoes to Japan. The shipment of mangoes in Japan was rejected for a chemical that the farmers had not even applied. So what's the problem? Your initial response would be to say to the Japanese authorities, your testing's wrong. You're picking up residues that don't exist. In other words, you need to recalibrate your machines. But that's not the case. What happened was that we subsequently went back to test the chemicals that we had actually used. The chemicals that we had used were product of China because of course they were cheaper. But those products contained residues of banned chemicals. So the farmers applied chemicals that contained other chemicals that they didn't know about that resulted in, in the rejection of a product then in an export market. So you see then how important then it becomes that if you're an exporter and you look at this concept as we've spoken about of a food system, you need to ensure that every part of the system is actually operating in unison. And that means going right back to your suppliers to ensure that you actually use quality accredited inputs so that you don't have the problems of chemical residues. And that's going to be, you see, part of the problem that you're going to face in Indonesia, that farmers will say, but this chemical is more expensive than the one that I can buy from my warong. But they don't understand that the product in the warong has come from China and is probably contaminated, which would mean that they're ultimately rejected in an export market. So you see, again, the importance to answer then the earlier question of coordination within the value chain. This is where the critical value is, is where we coordinate all the activities of all the actors within the chain to ensure compliance. And so when we start talking about some of the big banana plantations and the pineapple plantations that exist, for example, again, in Mindanao by companies like Dole or Del Monte or Sumi Fresh, these companies coordinate all of the inputs for this very reason that they have to be able to deliver a superior quality product and they have to meet it, the specifications. That is the challenge for Indonesia, is being able to meet those specifications. Okay, so we, what Indonesia needs to do is give more attention uh, to traceability by what? Uh, by... Value uh, chain management. Yeah. And then uh, we need to educate farmer about the regulation, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the last question. Okay. <laughs> From M. Bai Haki Erlangga Jati. What are the producer for, uh, oh, so, sorry, what are the procedure for producers to sell their goods or product directly to consumers, especially in Indonesia? And if this activity can be carried out, what will be the impact on the economy in agriculture? Okay. So as we've as we've as we've talked about, there there are there are multiple mechanisms or strategies for 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 direct marketing to farmers. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about a few more of them since we seem to be getting onto this direct marketing theme. As we've spoken about already, we've got farmers markets. We've also got direct sales to institutional users. That includes food processors, restaurants, and of course, supermarkets. We're also got e-commerce, direct sales then from farmers in terms of boxes or, or, or cartons 
from basically farm gate then through to, to household door. But of course, again, as I indicated to you a moment ago, I, I've been recently with, with Brari Jaya or Unibrow uh, in, in Malang. And of course, further up from Malang, of course, you have Batu. Of course, that's renowned throughout Indonesia, and I guess even from Semarang. You probably race off to the highlands of Batu occasionally in a weekend where it's cooler and, and it's nice. And of course, you engage in agrotourism. So agrotourism is another way and means by which we can directly link farmers to, to consumers. Yes, these activities can be carried out. But as I've indicated before, in order to do that, the farmers need to perform the activities that market intermediaries would ordinarily undertake. And that's generally beyond the capacity of individual farmers. So smallholder farmers have to come together. They have to form collaborative marketing groups. The benefit then of forming collaborative marketing groups, as we've started to see, is that there is a significant improvement in terms of costs. Because we're able to get improved costs in terms of the prices at which we're buying our inputs, our chemicals, our seeds, our fertilizers. But we've also got more efficiency in terms of our transportation and logistics. So that's going to result in cheaper prices. Now that can result then of course in us being able to better compete with other competitors, with other supermarkets and other suppliers, but it can also mean that we can improve our profitability. What it also means is that there's improved labor. So again, if you start to think about the fact that if we come back to the example I used a moment ago of, of for example, tempeh, if we actually grow the soybeans in Malang, then the soybeans that we actually produce is going to enhance and improve farmers' incomes. But then somebody's actually got to make the tempeh. And in terms of making the tempeh, then of course that creates employment, particularly for women and particularly for youth. So we start to see improved employment come out of this. We can also push towards other areas of, of certification. And let's take, for example, fair trade, particularly if we're dealing with export and or where we may also be dealing with institutional users. One of the requirements for fair trade is that we actually have an active cooperative or cluster because the fair trade premiums are not all paid to the producers, some of the fair trade premiums are paid to the community, where the community can then buy things like pencils and paper for school kids, or it might also engage in producing or, or, or building, for example, a health clinic. And so with a health clinic in the community, you can then attract an, uh, a doctor or a nurse to come to the village once a week to offer healthcare services that would otherwise not be available. So there's a whole range of impacts that direct marketing can have as a result of improving the, the cash flow into, into the, uh, the community. And that's what we actually try to do. That's, that's what, as you indicated in your very introduction, that's what my business is actually built around, is being able to provide these benefits to communities, not just to smallholder farmers, but indeed the whole communities within which these smallholders are embedded. Okay, thank you, Peter, for uh, answering the last question for today. And I think we had interesting discussion for today. Uh, we finally come to the end part of the seminar. Before I close the seminar, I would like to take the conclusion from what the speaker have presented. Uh, an agricultural and food supply chain consists of sequential operation from farm to fork, including input supply, production, post harvest, storage, processing, marketing distribution, food services, and consumption. Agri-food supply chain play important role in providing producer access to market. They affect economic, social, environmental sustainability of rural communities. Okay, uh, I think we get a lot of enlightenment for today. So I like to thank you so much to the speaker, Professor Peter Bad. Uh, thank you for the new insight and deeper knowledge about agri-food supply chain. Peter, we are looking forward to wel welcoming you in Semarang 
of course after this pandemic is over <laughs> i look forward to it okay great and also to all participants thank you very much for joining us from the first agenda last week uh, until today hopefully this seminar will be beneficial for everybody Amin, thank you very much and see you on the next occasion. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sama-sama. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Salam cinta dari ujung kandang. <laughs> wow. Yes, I'm from South East Sulawesi. Oh, nice to meet you. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, safe everyone. everyone. Safe, healthy, safe people. Safe I'm delighted. The thinking. Thank you so much. Innovation is important. Become business. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you again. Hope to see you next.